international ed events throughout the whole semester. But the Department of Education um, across the country has said this is one week where we'll focus on international ed. You may have seen some signs around campus about some of our global uh, studies programs. There's a trip to Panama. You might want to check that out and get involved with it. Also a trip, trip to Belize. Why not extend your education and really, really get a lot out of your time here at the college? Well, it's, I actually have one reminder for you. I almost forgot. Please put your phone on silence, or better yet, turn it off. I find if I have mine off, I won't be tempted to be distracted at any moment when I suddenly have a thought that I should text somebody or something. So it's good to be here now and be fully present. So that's what that's about. So please turn your phones off. It's my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. David Munoz, who also has been bringing events to this college for many, many years. This is the fourth year he has featured a very important Chicano writer. And so I'd like to just acknowledge and uh, congratulate him on his work here at the college. Good morning. Buenos dias, everybody. Good morning. We have a great privilege today because we have with us uh, Luis Valdez. For those of you that don't know much about this guy, this guy is the guy that wrote and directed the first Chicano play that was put on Broadway. He was also the man that directed the film version. And I don't know, maybe some of you saw that film some years ago entitled La Bamba. He was the writer and the director of it. And it is a privilege to have him come today to our campus. Uh, Luis Valdez was born in Delano, California. He got a bachelor's degree in English from San Jose State University. He has several doctoral degrees from San Jose State University, California Institute of the Arts, Santa Clara University, University of Rhode Island, University of South Florida. So he's doctor, 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 doctor. <laughs> it is a great privilege. And uh, I need to share this with you before I give the time to my maestro. Uh, when I was a young guy, I used to be an actor. I used to belong to a theater company named Teatro Meta. I worked with Jorge Huerta and William Burgess in the 70s. And that's the time that Dr. Valdez really was up there. And I swear to you, he was the hero for all of us. And it has a special meaning for me to have the privilege of introducing to you a great man, a great writer, a great playwright, and someone that has been called the grandfather of Chicano theater, el doctor Luis Valdez. Gracias, David. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here with all of you. Chandler Gilbert, I'm going to move away from the podium here. Podiums and I don't get along too well. And I don't want to hide behind it anyway. There's nothing to hide. I just want to say that uh, it's always a privilege to be able to address students at an institution of higher learning. The emphasis being on learning, the emphasis being on education. The parameters of anyone's education, I think, determine the kind of human beings that they are and they will become. Hopefully, you know, education can open doors, can open minds, we're in a constant process of evolution as a human race and also as regions, vast regions of the human race. I like to think of myself as a citizen of the Western Hemisphere. I'm a continental American. And I'd like to share some thoughts today about what that means to me, what that might mean to you. A few years ago, my wife Lupe and I went to Sonora uh, to do some research for a play that I wrote called Mummified uh, Deer. It was uh, a play that premiered in the year 2000 at the San Diego Rep. And so, under the auspices of the Calafia Initiative, Calafia being the queen, the Amazon, Amazonian queen for which California was named, uh, the Calafia Initiative uh, allowed us to go to Hermosillo, not far from here. And under the auspices of the University of Hermosillo, we began to uh, do some research among the Yaqui, who happened to be uh, 
by ancestral people. And uh, we went out to Caborca, which is not far from the U.S.-Mexican border, and a uh, university anthropologist took us out to some rocks, and we saw some petroglyphs that had been there for thousands of years. These were the signs that, I suppose, my ancient ancestors and yours also, left on those rocks in their constant traffic across the desert to the Sea of Cortez to fish, to pick up seafood, whatever. But they were signs of human traffic in this region across the enormity of this great Sonora Desert that dates back before written history. And so some individuals had written their history in petroglyphs on these rocks, and they're right there, right outside of Caborca. You may know Caborca. Anybody know Caborca here? Anybody? You've been there? Okay. There's a church there, which is really interesting because it's an exact replica of the mission of San Javier del Bac, which is right outside of Tucson. As a matter of fact, it was created by the same missionary priest, you know, Francisco Sevio Quino, who established one in, in Tucson, and then uh, nearby in Caborca, which is perhaps 50 miles inland from Mexico, in Sonora, he established a church. Now this is the church where my maternal grandmother, who was born in Caborca, was baptized in 1884. My grandfather, her husband, uh, was born in Alta, which is even further uh, north, closer to the U.S.-Mexican border. And he was born uh, also in the 1880s, and uh, they were the ones that eventually crossed the border on my mother's side. On the other side, on my dad's side, my grandfather, my grandfather Santiago Valdez, was a miner, and he was working in Cananea in 1905, when a huge strike of miners in 1905 precipitated what became the Mexican Revolution of 1910. He was one of the strikers. He was about 19, he was real young. And he couldn't uh, go back to work in the mines, so he went to work for the railroad and ended up uh, building the railroad, Ferrocarriles Nacionales de Mexico, the National Railroad, that reached Nogales and the U.S.-Mexican border, finally. There had been no railroad previously, so he was out there cutting track, laying track. And so he was responsible for helping to bring the railroad to Nogales, where, my, where he married my grandmother in 1910, and my dad was born in 1912. My dad was born in Nogales, and at that time there was no distinction between Nogales, Arizona, and Nogales, Sonora, or Nogales, USA, and Nogales, Mexico, because Arizona was a territory. Arizona was still a territory. And there was virtually no Mexican border. There was a fictitious line that was drawn on maps across the desert, but in actuality, the border didn't come into existence until they activated the Border Patrol in 1924. That's not so long ago. In 1924, my paternal grandfather died here in Mesa, and he is buried uh, in the cemetery, the original cemetery in Mesa here in Arizona, and here his bones have laid ever since. My dad was 12 when he died, he called my dad to his uh, deathbed, essentially, and said, uh, Miko, my son, he says, you, you're going to be the man of the family now. Take care of your mother and your brothers and your sister. And so my dad was in the fifth grade. He never went back to school. He went right back to work, like a lot of kids in those days, and went to support his, uh, his brothers, his mother, and his, uh, his sister, my aunt. Uh, eventually, the family went, moved uh, to California. They went to uh, develop King Cotton in the great southern part of the San Joaquin Valley in California, which is not unlike Tucson. It's not unlike, Cal not unlike Arizona, actually. I think that's why my grandparents on both sides, uh, my, my mother's father and mother and my grandmother on my dad's side, liked uh, the weather there. They settled there. But actually, there was literally nothing out there. There was nothing out there because they were just creating all that agriculture that became the major industry of the state of California. And uh, like a lot of immigrants, my grandparents were instrumental in doing the hard work 
of digging up, of planting, eventually of harvesting, and they took part in the creation of a major industry in California. I know that because I made it my business to find out the history of my family. In doing so, I've learned something about the history of regions and the history of America. I know this about our country, about America. We're a dynamic country, a country that has been subject to change, a country that's been evolving for a couple of centuries, inside another America that has been evolving for 500 years, inside another hemisphere that's been evolving for 50,000 years. Okay, and uh, of those maybe 20, 30,000 years have been marked you know, by recordable human history, either on petroglyphs or in ruins that are left across the Americas. If you are students of America, if you are students of America, then I hope that you will dig deep. That you don't confuse something as simple as the borders of the United States of America with America. This is a very recent phenomenon in our country here. I was born here, I was born in California, proud to be an American, but I'm a continental American. And it's taken me a lifelong journey to get to the point where I can understand a little bit of what the future demands from us. Now I understand that there's a controversy in this state that they're trying to eliminate ethnic studies and, and this is a terrible tragedy. This is a strike in favor of ignorance. This is a strike in favor of ignorance about what America is, what America has been, what America is all about. It is a, a strike against common sense. Common sense because we're talking about a hemisphere with a lot of commonalities. In order to get to those ideas, let me share some personal stuff with you. Because I'm a man of the theater, I'm a filmmaker, and my journey has not been direct. It's been a spiral, like all life. All life is a spiral. It begins with our DNA, but as we go through life, we continue to spiral. We sometimes don't know where things are headed, you know, until later, until they work out, then we see. So I was born in Delano, California in 1940. I was born in a labor camp a tiny little labor camp, a little shack, my grandmother, my grandmother's shack actually. And I didn't know who I was, like all of us, you don't know, you're born, come out of your mama, you look around, say, where am I? You know, you try to locate yourself. What am I? What am I? Uh, somewhere along the line, uh, um, I discovered that who my mom was, you know. I was breastfed, so I knew what that was, you know. <laughs> there it is. I knew what my center was, you know. And, and, uh, the thing is that uh, I learned, uh, whether I knew it consciously or not, that I was a migrant farm worker. And uh, I was born into a migrant farm working family. Because my parents, who went from Arizona to California, were not only picking cotton and grapes, they were also picking everything else under the sun in California. It was the Garden of Eden up north around San Jose. They used to go every year to pick uh, prunes and cotton, I mean uh, apricots and uh, strawberries and uh, whatever there was up there, peaches. The Garden of Eden, veritable Garden of Eden, and they were happy to do that. But the thing is, I didn't know that, you know, so I was in the fields before I could even walk. I was in my mother's arms. One year, uh, we were in a place called uh, San Martin, living in a farmer's barn. And that seemed to be typical for those days. They, they took the animals out, they took the horses and the cows out, put the Mexicans in. Fair exchange. And this was housing for farm workers, you know. A lot of this has not changed. I didn't know any different, you know. But you know, we used to, we were traveling with my cousin, so it was a family operation, and we had a portable stove, which was basically a tin tub with a hole cut on the side. This was very portable, it was lightweight, and uh, the top became a griddle, you know, you could stick uh, sticks and stuff inside and heat it up, and all the tortillas and the beans or whatever, the coffee would be prepared right on top of the, the tub. And one morning, everybody's getting ready to go to work, and by this time, I'm starting to crawl, okay? I'm starting to walk. And I had a little cousin older than me who could uh, already walk. And uh, in a moment of uh, carelessness, because people were getting ready to go to work, uh, my aunt had put uh, a pan of hot water to heat my cousin's hot water bottle. She took her milk bottle into the field so she could sit in her box and, and drink her milk. My milk was on my mother's chest, <laughs> so there, you know, it was portable. It was there already. So uh, I wasn't worried. I was you know, crawling around, gateando, you say in Spanish, and uh, my cousin uh, reached over and grabbed the handle of this little uh, pan that was full of hot water, pulled on it, it tipped over and fell on my back. 
and uh, I screamed, passed out, I'm one year old, you know. And they took me to the nearest hospital in a place called Gilroy, the capital of the world. And uh, into a, a, it was a white hospital. And so here come this bunch of Mexican farm workers in there and they put me in the emergency room, tiny little emergency room, opened up the blanket and all the skin on my back slid off. And my mother, and I, I was unconscious, and my mother was afraid I was dying. Today, I'd probably be in an ICU. I was severely burned. But it's 1941. And these are Mexicans. What are you going to do with them? So, uh, I was given something, they put something on my back, and I was released into my mother's care to go back to the horse barn. Now, I might have gotten an infection or what have you. I've always believed, though, that regardless of what happens to you, any negative can be turned into a positive. And here's what happened to me. For the next six months, I slept on my mother's stomach. Face to face, chest to chest. Against my mother's heart. She was afraid, she was only 20 years old at the time, so she was afraid to let me slide onto my back, you know. So for six months, I slept face to face on my mother's stomach, heart to heart. And you know what this is? It energized me. It filled my batteries. Me chula pum as you say in Spanish, you know, it turned my pump on. And the thing is that uh, the hot water that hit my back happened to hit me in the small of my back. Now, I'm a man of the theater. And I know something about the human body, and I know something about the movement of the spine in order to act. I also know that the central nervous system is like a channel of energy, it's a tube of lightning that allows us to communicate with our extremities from the central nervous system, you know, to the peripheral nervous system, all the way to the tips of your fingers and your head. This is what allows you to learn. That's why sitting at desk sometimes isn't the best way to learn. The best way to learn is on your feet, actually. And the best way to learn is to move. This is why the arts and dance and sports are part of our educational experience. And those that would deny this to students in behest of education don't know what the hell they're talking about. They don't understand the human being. But we got to learn this, you know, when I was one year old, when that hot water hit me, whoa, right there, forcing me then to spend the next six months face to face with my mom. And she was feeding me all her love. And you know, that powered me. That negative became a real positive. Six years later, let me flash forward. We're still on the migrant path. World War II has come and gone. And we're working, uh, you know, doing the Garden of Eden up in the Santa Clara Valley, now the Silicon Valley. And then we head over the mountain into the Santa Clara, into the San Joaquin Valley, the Central Valley, to pick cotton. And we're standing, we're, we're living in a huge labor camp with maybe 2,000 farm workers, the army surplus tents. Everybody's out there, you know. And in those days, farm workers in California, perhaps here in Arizona too, came in all colors. I mean, we had Okies, you know, from Oklahoma. We had African Americans from the South. We had Filipinos. We had Japanese. We had Chinese. And of course, Mexicans and Puerto Ricans, Latinos. As a kid, I used to go out and work in the fields with my family, and I'd see the whole world out there. I'd say, well, we're all equal, right? <laughs> we're all out of here. Look at that. We're all out here. And, and the thing is, I didn't know that uh, what we're laying in, in, in ahead of us, you know. Today, you go out into the fields, you're going to find a lot of Mexicans, basically. Maybe some Filipinos, although they've kind of phased out. Not too many other minorities. No white people, basically, to speak of. Very few African Americans. That's sort of been left to the Mexicans. Let them work in the fields. They're good at it. Built close to the ground, as Senator George Murphy once said. They, 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 it's really good for them. But in those days, I mean, everybody was out there. So I thought we were all universally poor, all alike. Hey, this is a human race. It was great. Well, there were so many people out there, you know, because farm workers lived the Depression into the 1950s. It wasn't over with World War II. The Depression ended in the 50s for farm workers. And, and, and so we were, the cotton season came and went real quick in a month, man. All the, the cotton had been picked. And so the tent, start, the tent started to come down and uh, people started to leave the camp and we're not going anywhere because my dad's truck is broken down. It's a little pickup truck that we traveled in and uh, couldn't move. And so 
we moved into one of the emptied out shacks and, uh, and waited really for my dad to get the truck fixed. You know, farm workers live from hand to mouth. And so at that time, I mean, we ran out of money, basically. The cotton season was over, you know, they didn't pay that much to begin with. So we're living hand to mouth and uh, we're fishing in the nearby river, the San Joaquin River for fish. And my mother had the flour tortillas, and we had beans, and uh, we'd have fish tacos before they were trendy, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> One morning, I'm out there real early with my brother trying to fish, and uh, I fall into the river and I almost drown. And so my mother got really uh, scared, frightened. She said, maybe you better go to school. We're not going to be here very long, but there's a bus that comes in every day. You and your brother climb another bus and go to school. So we went to school. And what I took is, it's, it's already like late October, you know, uh, early November. And, and so what I took was my lunch, basically your mother's tacos in a little brown paper bag. Somehow in the company store, she'd commandeered a little brown paper bag. In 1946, there were paper shortages. And I didn't want to take my lunch in a CNA sugar sack. Uh, uh, there were no plastic bags in those days. It would be embarrassing. But my mom got this little brown paper sack that was my size. And she put mama's tacos in there, right? And I carry them under my jacket. There's nothing more wonderful than mama's tacos, you know. <laughs> Particularly on a cold morning, you know, under my jacket. I knew I wasn't going to be in school for very long. What the hell, I had my tacos, you know. <laughs> and so uh, at lunch, you know, we, we'd go out there and it was a country school, so there was no cafeteria. People brought their lunch pails. And that was another shock. It, uh, it was shock because I noticed it, the kids. Some of the other kids had, um, the Anglo kids especially, they had lunch pails. Lunch pails, man. You know, with Mickey Mouse and Blazing on the side, up along Cassidy. And then they'd open up these, these, these lunch pails and out comes uh, two pieces of white board, you know, wrapped up, oh no, white bread. <laughs> it was white bread. <laughs> and they had bologna and they had cheese and they had lettuce and tomato and hey, productions, you know. And then I noticed that also they, and some of them had apples. They could pull out an apple or a cupcake. You know, and here's the kicker. They pull out a thermos, open it up, and there's milk. Or Coke. Coca-Cola. And so when I, I saw that, I looked back at my little bag, man. And my little brown bag looked really bad, you know what I'm saying? It's just, oh my God, yeah, I was swept with shame. I was swept with shame, man. Mama's taco, suddenly, this emblem of my mama's love for me, suddenly became the shameful thing, you know. And you know, I don't know if you know burritos, you know, flour tacos. When they're warm, they're nice and fat and warm and nice and smooth, you know, but when they get cold, they tend to get a little shriveled, you know, a little chatty you know, like that. So, I mean, I was even more embarrassed, you know, to pull them out in public. And so I ate them like a wino drinks his bottle, right? One bite at a time. I pull it out, you know. The kids would be over there saying, what are you eating? Oh, no, 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 no. And then I kept looking at them, you know, they kept looking at me, and I kept looking at their lunches, they kept looking at mine. So one day the inevitable happened. We exchanged lunches! And the rest is Taco Bell history. <laughs> so I, I had to take care of my bag. And so uh, I used to put it in the closet, and one day I go to pick it up, it's gone. The teacher sees me running around, says, what is it? And I told her, she said, oh, a little brown paper bag. She said, I took it. I said, well, give it back. She says, I can't. And she took me into her back room, and there was my bag all wrapped up, floating in a basin of water. I thought the teacher had gone nuts. They were you loca la maestra. You know what I'm saying? She says, no, no, wait a minute, look at this. And she reached in, grabbed a piece of my mother's taco bag, dipped it into some white paste, and then she put it on a mold of plastic, clay mold, face. It's a monkey. And then she put another one, smoothed it out, another one, smoothed it out. And at that moment, I recognized and realized one of the secrets of the universe is called paper mache. <laughs> she was making a mask. She said, you want to try it? Yeah. So she smoothed it out, you know. And I knew it was already November, past Halloween. What is this for? And she said, it's for a play. It's for a play. And uh, we're going to have tryouts. We need two first graders to play monkeys. It's called Christmas in the Jungle. Are you interested? Oh, man, am I interested? I forgave her about the bag, you know what I mean? So the next Monday I had my first audition. And you know what? I got my first role in the theater. It was amazing. I was one of two monkeys. The whole school was involved, you know? The, the school band was involved. And I remember having this little beat up little school auditorium way out in the middle of nowhere in the San Joaquin Valley being converted. You know, they put up the fake trees and the band started to play. And I had a costume that was better than my own clothes. You know, I had uh, some little red pants, you know? Little red vest, I had little red shoes, 
curly coat, had a tail, a little hat, and then that mask made from Mama's taco bag. Incredible. The teacher had painted it beautifully. And I mean, I was, you know, oh, this, is, this was it, man. I was looking forward to my debut before the world. I was six years old. I was like, here I come, world. Here I am. My parents are going to see me. The whole school is going to see me. It's great, you know, with all the eighth graders and everybody performing. Well, the week of the show, we started rehearsing. And the week of the show, I come home to the camp. And I tell my mom, uh, you know, and my mom says, we're leaving tomorrow. I said, what? She says, we're, we're leaving. I said, but mom, the show's on Friday. This was like a Tuesday or a Wednesday. And she says, uh, we can't stay, Milo. We've been evicted. And I cried. And so she cried with me. But you know, the next morning, it was a foggy morning. I'll never forget, I was in the back of the truck. As we pulled out of this little town where the school was, a little town called Stratford. Not Stratford on Avon, Stratford on the San Joaquin. <laughs> and as we pulled out, and I saw it disappear into the fog, I felt this hole open up in my chest. I could have been destroyed. I was six years old, I hadn't even begun to live yet, and here I was, being deprived of my opportunity. But again, any positive, I mean any negative can be turned into a positive. So what happened is that I took with me the secret of paper mache. And I took with me the desire to be in a play. So forever afterward, when I was growing up, my form of play was to put on plays. And I play with my cousins, you know, they want to play war, I want to play theater, you know. And then I could make masks out of paper mache. And any place would be suffice, you know, any old house would be good, any old barn, I could turn it into a little theater, I could do it under the trees, you know. And the thing is that uh, eventually my, my cousin began to get tired of bored, said, no, we're tired of doing theater. And I said, well, how come you're tired? He said, well, because we don't know what to say. And I said, hold on, say this. <laughs> And without knowing it, I became a playwright at seven and eight years old. And again, because of a negative. And you know, that hole in my chest, that hole in my chest is still there. It's smaller now, but it's still there. But for the last 65 years, I'm 71 now, 65 years, I've been pouring short stories, poems, plays, screenplays, you understand, into that hole. It became the hungry mouth of my creativity. It became my raison d'etre. It became the reason why I live, why I am an artist. It became the one thing that I knew I could control. I never knew the teacher, but a few years ago I was speaking to a conference of superintendents in Monterey, California. The present superintendent of that district was there. He loved the story. So he went back and checked his records a couple of weeks later, I got in the mail a photostatic copy. Well, first it was a brick from the old school because the school had been torn down. And, but a photostatic copy of the attendance record for the first grade for 1946. And there at the bottom of the list of the students is Louis Valdez, who was in that school for 30 days. A migrant child come and gone with the wind. And at the top of the page was my teacher's name, Ruth Tremaine. I don't know where Ruth Tremaine is today. I never saw her again. If she's alive, God bless her, she must be 120 years old. You know? <laughs> but the fact is that she launched me. I think maybe she knew something about me because of my enthusiasm. But I, whether she knew or not, she launched me. And this is what I tell future teachers, I tell everybody. You never know who you're meeting. You never know who you're going to influence. It could be a migrant child you've only met for 30 days, one month, but you end up changing their lives. Because what I received out of this experience, eventually was my voice, was an opportunity to be able to speak, to speak. That took me through a number of different things in my career. Eventually, my cousins, I say, got tired of doing theater with me, so I made puppets. <laughs> and I became a puppeteer. I had all my puppets in a cardboard box, and I could do that. I was 12 years old, and then, willy-nilly, along the way, I picked up a used ventriloquist dummy, an old Jerry Mahoney dummy, and uh, I started to do ventriloquism. Now, I never questioned that the identity of the dummy was an Anglo. He looked Anglo. And so I called him Ali Nelson. 
And he became my, uh, my Anglo alter ego. We used to talk. We were friends. We were buddies. I put a little goatee on him, a little hat that said cool cat. Because you see, he had to be cool. If he was Anglo and hang out with me, he had to be cool. <laughs> he had to be cool. And so eventually, uh, I saw another ventriloquist, a Mexican ventriloquist in the San Joaquin Valley. And, and he had a Mexican dummy, and I said, well, I'm missing this other part. So I made a Mexican dummy. And he was called Marcelino Pipin. And so I put one on one knee and put the other one, and I'd have a bilingual contest, you know what I mean? I'd be going shooting back and forth in English and in Spanish. Bilingualism is very interesting, you know, because it's the workings of the human brain. You could do half a sentence in Spanish, y la otra parte en español, digo, en inglés. You know, it's, it's cross-hatching. They've learned that bilingualism helps you to fund your brain to function. If children become bilingual at an early age, they become, by virtue of that act, more intelligent because what you're doing is you're cross-switching. You're switching gears. You're, you're, you're connecting and disconnecting. So all those people say English only are voting for ignorance. They're voting for less education, not more education. Es necesario hablar español porque hay mucha gente que habla español. Hay más de 300, 400 millones de gentes que hablan español en América. Do you know what I said? I said there are 300 to 400 million people that speak Spanish in America. America as a whole. It's one of two European languages in our hemisphere. One is Spanish and the other is English. And to deny that presence, to deny it as if it is something unworthy, is, is nothing but sheer ignorance, I must tell you. And it's fun, de vez en cuando, to speak Spanish, ¿me entiendes? Hablar como un chicano, 